All righty. <clears throat> so let me um, take cover from uh, this longitudinal W boson scattering that we just discussed in this limit of um, high energy, where we can use the equivalent theorem um, to take those two descriptions, those two Lagrangians that we had in compute, uh, what should be the same amplitude. Um, and as, as you know, there's other channels that will grow with energy. There's um, the scattering of the W and the Z longitudinal components, for example, or um, the scattering of longitudinal components with fermions also grows with energy. As again, you've been um, talked about in this MEFT lectures. Now, I was saying or promising that <clears throat> This amplitude will let us know what is the finite range of application of the theory. Why is that? That is because we have probability to tell us something about our um, theories in the form of unitarity. Unitarity is nothing more than a probability conservation. Uh, the S matrix, um, I just answering the question of um, propagation of one initial state to a final state. For example, summing over all of the possibilities uh, for a given scattering, we should uh, obtain one. And this quantity uh, of unitarity as connected to probability conservation, is something that you might be more familiar with from um, quantum mechanics, ordinary quantum mechanics, where you do have that the evolution of any system is the exponentiated uh, Hamiltonian, which is itself Hermitian and the exponential of a Hermitian matrix gives you a unitary uh, matrix. In ordinary um, matrices, that means that uh, not, not any one entry is larger than one, for example, in those elements of, of your matrix. When you apply this um, to the S matrix, that lives in this space of in and out states and momenta. Uh, it is a bit more complicated than that, but I think you might be introduced to it in um, Professor Huang's uh, lecture. So I'm gonna assume that you know a bit about it, but all we need here really is um, the constraints that come out of that, that tells us in particular, when we decompose into partial wave amplitude, with legendary polynomials for our um, scalar scattering, that the integral over the scattering angle, the real part of it, or a half has to be less than eight pi. Now this interval is trivial because we had no scattering angle in our amplitude that we wrote here. So that just returns amplitude and we can translate uh, this unitary bound into a bound on S over B squared. This is all, all fine um, and consistent as long as the energy is low enough. It's telling me my connection is unstable. So please do stop me if, uh, if you can't hear me or something. Um, but as the energy grows, the central mass energy uh, that we can write at P squared, approximately E squared for C squared, this relation is violated. If we go in energy high enough, and that will be for energy set so for square root of A pi times that very electroweak depth that we talked about, but that's it. Mind you, we do know from the W mass, I'm putting the numbers in, you get in here a uh, uh, tera electron ball, that is a thousand giga electron ball scale. We cannot uh, make sense of a theory that giving us um, probability is larger than one. That's not something that you can give up. Um, so this is really a strong argument for something else to take over at this energy. It is our strongest argument really to tell us that there's something else 
that has to kick in and those energies. And it was the reason that PLHC was um, thought of as a discovery machine because it had to find something in here via this theory argument. And having said all of this is a theory argument, if you as experimentalist, you might have other takes on it. But they did uh, discover the Higgs. Uh, so they, I think that improved their uh, belief in what we say. It is now almost a 10 year old, actually, it might be around just 10 years. I forget when it's the anniversary of the discovery of the Higgs boson that answered this uh, unitary question. And as far as we know, it's a scalar parity plus particle with no um, CP or P violating interactions. And its transformation properties under the gauge group are as simple as you can get it. The transform field is the field itself. And I should say, well, it was a great discovery and very welcome. Um, the theory community was expecting it already, in part um, for the strong uh, argument that I just outlined of the entirety violation and the need for something else, but also for um, the fit of the standard model of particle physics that had these Higgs uh, simulating there that was well in agreement with um, electric precision data and the bad state of the opposition um, in the form of uh, technicolor models that were not all that um, suitable to experimental data. Excuse me. I, I, I have a question. Uh, it mm -hmm. seems to me that the, uh, it's being singular on the game group could be uh, misleading to the audience, I guess. Right, so this will be a big part of... Um, it's not really yeah. singular, right? Yeah, sorry, so let's make... Well, I'll make this distinction clearer uh, later on, but this... this Higgs little h that I'm talking about, it is sing it's a single bit of freedom, it's a scalar particle, and the way I'm defining it, it is a, it is, maybe I should, well, maybe I shouldn't use singlet if people think of uh, complete representations of uh, the electroweak symmetry, but it is, it does have these transformation properties and the point of, have this to relate this or distinguish it from the case in which the Higgs is a doublet um, and it does transform uh, linearly. So I'm not sure if you want to uh, not call this a singlet, put it on, on, uh, on quotes, but what remains true is that under the gauge group, the way this degree of freedom is transformed is um, like this. You can also think of this, and, and we'll see if you have a, a doublet, the radial direction. Yeah, that's a good analogy. So if you have a, say, a 2D space, and you have that the equivalent of your gauge symmetries are rotations around the um, origin, even if you have a linear, representation by one by two that just rotates under this transformation you can always define by one square plus by two square square root and this component does not transform under the, the symmetry that is the radius the radius doesn't change under a rotation so that's um, in a nutshell why I'm saying this degree of freedom is a singlet. It's like radial in this uh, notation. Is that um, clarified somewhat? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I think that, I just, yeah, Higgs is a singlet on the unbroken gauge group. That is the kind of the U1 electromagnetic. H is singular. 
Yeah, but it's also, it's also true. Of, of course, it's a, it's a U1 electromagnetic, it has no charge, but it's also true that, well, if you want to, for now, it's just my definition. This field does not transform under the, the gauge group. You do a gauge transformation, this guy doesn't feel it. The way that is defined in terms of more familiar Arrhenia representations will be something like this. Um, but it's, uh, it's if you want to this far a definition, and then we will I'll see how it connects with more familiar linear representation notation. Maybe if if one thinks of, of this same um, the same discussion can be applied to a U one a U one symmetry for a complex field. I would just pick up a phase under a transformation. And just in here, you can also parameterize by as the exponential of some theta field and the modulus of pi. And in this coordinate, we also have that only this theta field fields those shifts under the symmetry. And what I'm saying is that the modulus of that uh, field is. Um, I'm calling it a singlet. What I'm saying is that it doesn't transform under that symmetry. It's like changing to polar coordinates with the radius. Okay, good, thanks. Um, hopefully, I mean, this is a very relevant point and it's a lot of what these lectures are about. And, um, hopefully it will become clearer, but just bear with me uh, having this little H, which is um, has the following transformation properties. And the point then is that I can, if there's no constraint on how it transforms, I have more freedom in writing this term in the Lagrangian and putting it in. There's no constraints on how to um, put it, introduce an interaction. So for example, I can write in a kinetic term. Was anybody saying something? Okay. Um, so I can write a kinetic term in here. Okay, I can also write in any of the terms that I wrote, arbitrary functions of the Higgs singlet, um, which I just, I'm just assuming that they have a series, uh, Taylor series in H, so any one function will be just F zero, F prime of zero times H, F prime prime of H square. And I can insert him back into the Lagrangian that I had, it's a function that for the Goldstone um, kinetic term, I just called F of F of H square. You can also have it for the gauge boson kinetic term. For fermions, you can redefine it away, and that's what we should assume. This also comes with its own potential, the of little h, and it can also accompany uh, the Yukawa couplings, and we just recycle this matrix Y to now not only be a constant, but depend on uh, the Higgs singlet itself. Okay. Um, so how does this field in particular helps with that entire problem? Can be again realized when we go to the amplitudes. So first we do define f of zero to be one um, in that kinetic energy term. So that when we expand this guy, the bosons will be normalized with electron pep. In particular, that helps us recover um, the relation of the W mass with the electroweak pep and, and the weak isos spin coupling. Whereas the first, uh, the next term in that expansion on the Higgs will give us a coupling for both of our um, actions, 
4 pi and omega. It looks like you know, something like that expansion, the, um, the single insertion of this field little h that we've introduced and the derivative of pi in that case with the first derivative of this function of the Higgs field evaluated at the vacuum that you can again transform into um, charge components under the, electro uh, excuse me, under the electromagnetism um, interaction by plus and by minus, so W plus and W minus. Out of this, you can derive a three-point vertex in here of, well, I'm, I'm writing wavy lines, but all of these are uh, the longitudinal components of pitch functions. So again, we're looking at W plus in particular scattering. And now if you think of the diagrams that this um, three-point vertex interaction would add up uh, to your theory, well, like we said, it uh, doesn't transform under the gauge group, and in particular, has no electromagnetic charge, so it cannot be on the um, S channel here, because that will be a particle with charge plus two. But you can have it on the T channel or on the U channel, that exchanging of what we call um, each of the two W portions. I remember this was uh, PK going to pre prime, K prime, and I just exchanging that. So you can um, do this again yourself, and it is outlined in the notes how to go about it. Just adding up this with the contributions that you already had, uh, not forgetting that. Um, all of the Feynman vertex come with that insertion of I um, on the path interval formulation and the propagator of the Higgs little h in here that comes with on its own factor of I, but you will get that in that case, the amplitude gets an extra contribution on top of the one you've computed. That looks something like F prime square for the two vertices in here times that same central mass energy. Again, using that expansion of uh, neglected masses, in particular in um, this little h propagator, we neglected in the denominator as well. And that means that it has, well, first of all, the right sign to cancel out that growth um, is the square of a coupling with a minus sign up front. So it has the potential to cancel that growth with energy. And if indeed you select F prime of zero one over V at electroweak F, it will completely cancel that growth with central mass energy S. That will make the problem go away in that channel. There's other channels, like we said, that also have uh, that growth energy. For example, you can look at um, scattering of W plus W minus to two hexes. That will depend both on uh, those couplings that we wrote in diagrams such as this, but it will also be sensitive to the two Higgs coupling insertion. It is actually a nice exercise itself uh, to be done, compute that, and that depends on the second derivative of um, that function f. This is not a diagram that was there before we introduced this little h, but now it's there and has its own unitary problem. And as you've been told, there's also growth of energy for the for example, scattering of W plus W minus to a pair of fermions. And you find with this um, reasoning that the functions that will completely cancel all of these terms look something like this. So for starters, that function in front of um, each boson that we could have 
as allowed by gauge invariance should be exactly one. That function f should be one plus h over b, so that the first derivative gives us that one over b factor, and the second derivative directly proportional to that s in there um, cancels. Out of scatterings like this, you conclude that the Yukawa um, term should have a dependence also linear in one plus h over v, thanks to the usual Yukawa. And then it's not so evident, but the potential should look something like um, v plus h squared times a mass term and um, a quartic um, term in h plus v. So this is, and I think in, this might be causing some of the uh, rise eyebrows about calling this a singlet. This is coming at it from an angle which we don't usually come to the standard model. And in particular, from this point of view, these all look like funny choices for functions. And there's nothing that would a priori before doing this exercise of computing um, amplitudes that grow with energy would tell us this is a special theory. Yet we do know, and I'm drawing now from other uh, knowledge that you have about the standard model, that it is a very special theory and indeed is self-consistent in a way that I'll talk a bit more about. And here's where we connect with something that will be more familiar uh, to you. In the case in which we can, um, and this is where I should be careful, and call things different things differently. We can define a Higgs doublet now for this theory. A Higgs doublet that um, will have its own two, two, two components because it's a doublet and it's two um, weak. The upper component, some H plus a complex field and the lower component is the VEV plus a field that is different. And here's where I should be careful. This is a different field from the H we were talking about, which is the real component of that um, lower entry of our doublet. And then a pseudo scalar that I call E time here. Now, the parametrization that we were using was exactly, or exactly was the analogous of that radius and angles parametrization because we're calling this that unitary matrix U that depends only on Goldstone and needs to be removed by a pure gauge transformation. And an overall coefficient that is the equivalent of that radius that does indeed not fill any of the gauge transformations because all of them affect the matrix U in there. Right, so under, because under a gauge transformation, we have that this Higgs tablet picks up um, a matrix G and when we translate this into a new transform G and a new transform B plus H. Because we have that a unitary would because we have that, that a unitary matrix times a unitary matrix is still a unitary matrix. This is what the transform G looks like. Whereas B plus H, they just stay the same. Okay, so I hope this actually clears up that uh, question about why am I saying this little H does it transform under the gauge group? If we bring it back to a theory that you might be more familiar with, what I'm saying is that this H will correspond to this radial or this modulus um, of the Higgs uh, tablet in that case. And in particular, that's also why in the potential H dagger H only depends on my field B plus H square and not any of the other fields. Great. Um, right, so this is, I mean, it's quite not a non trivial change of coordinates indeed. And <clears throat> just as we've reviewed for other Lagrangians, if you do things right, change of coordinates shouldn't mean that any of the physics is different. It just means that you're looking at it uh, from a different angle. And you can 
again, in an exercise, suggested in the notes, check that this um, relation holds for these, the functions that we outlined before. So if I put in the standard model function that I wrote earlier, times b squared, and these bosons, I can rewrite this as a covariant derivative on the Higgs doublet that I've just introduced, contract it with itself. Um, after using some of the relations for these uh, derivatives on constant and bosons and rewriting that trace in terms of uh, vector. <clears throat> Not only that, but the rest of the Lagrangian can be written in terms of this doublet in particular that um, coupling to fermions can be written in terms of this H tilde that, that I think uh, Professor Trott has defined, but I'll just give it to you again. It's just I sigma two times the complex conjugate of that doublet. <clears throat> the same for leptons, but I don't write it here explicitly. That potential that we just wrote, now we see what it has, why it ha has that form of just two terms. Um, we write it in terms of the six doublet with that relation there. And well, the usual, the gauge part, if you like, that we knew described H interaction is still the same. And why is this a uh, remarkable theory? Well, perhaps I don't have to say much about that because you might know it already, but as far as uh, we're concerned from this EFT, this is a closed self-consistent theory up to arbitrarily high energies. That's what's special about this limit. Um, you might, here, this self-consistency phrased as uh, being renormalizable in that in, in other context, being renormalizable just means uh, being predicted that once you've specified, as it happens for this Lagrangian, this is the full Lagrangian for the standard model. Once you specify those three level um, action and measure every one of the inputs of the theory, the three gauge couplings, the masses uh, of fermions, um, the mass of the Higgs, you fully specify the theory uh, and at no point in quantum loop computations would you need a new counter term or new parameters that you didn't have since the beginning. Um, so that's why I'm saying the standard model is a self-sufficient um, theory after relatively high energies. Again, disregarding gravity will, uh, will eventually kick in at uh, 10 to the 19 giga electrovolts, but that's for Another set of lectures. So this cool. Okay. Good. Um, so hope that has cleared up what I meant by simulating there. If there's any more questions, some we take them. But what we're doing now, after taking this uh, detour uh, to look at one of the possibilities in Higgs particular theory, that is a standard model. That is, if you like one point in this very large theory space that Higgs effective field theory allows us to parameterize. We go back uh, to the general case. All of those functions F, P and Y are arbitrary. And we no longer have that the derivative of F prime, for example, is one over the electro with F. So we start laying out our Higgs of activity theory with those two first points um, in our list of requirements for our EFT. What is the particle content? What are the symmetry? That much we can already say. <clears throat> you just have to add to the previous uh, matter content with quarks and leptons or the entire matrix containing the gold stones. That is a doublet under uh, SU2, it picks up this unitary matrix multiplying on the left. For weak hypercharts, it has that uh, poly matrix, that third poly matrix, but multiplying on the right, uh, something to be noted. Whereas as we just outlined this little H, the way we define it, it picks up none of those. So it's, that's why I'm saying it's a singlet under all of those. And uh, this suffice to write all of the theory, but 
you might, um, if you want to discuss separately custodial uh, breaking or custodial preserving terms, um, which is a consistent thing to do as just, uh, as uh, Professor Trott just made me outline. Um, you can also consider this T matrix which violates custodial, uh, but after all this sigma three is none other than the generator of hypercharge, which is part of, of your theory. So you don't have to be so explicit about this being there. It's possibility of uh, building um, environments is already there. And now, <clears throat> sorry. Oh, I think I heard my own echo or something. <laughs> sorry, that was not a question, all right. Um, one of the main questions that this, um, <clears throat> lectures aim at answering is when does our um, Higgs effective field theory can be written down as a standard model effective field theory. Again, very much related to the question we had before. When can I just write a doublet containing four degrees of freedom and not talk about that funny singlet that I was mentioning before, but just everything in terms of this one component that groups together uh, the goldstones and little h. In general, when we're not in the standard model, we'll have to be careful about naming and say that this guy takes a different bet that need not be exactly 246 big electron volts. And that field that we call um, that radial component in there not, need not be exactly the h we define in there because for once, uh, for one, the um, we had it defined canonically, the kinetic term, and you may have extra contributions in there. But still, all of these are related to field transformations. Uh, so the physics should be independent uh, of any of this. And then the question is, when our theory admits such a definition for two separate uh, building block elements, U and H are no longer independent, but they always come in this combination, which therefore means um, a reduced or, or a special possibility in Higgs effective theory that it need not be there. But if it is there, then we can write for Lagrangian in terms of that linear representation, capital H, and we end up with a standard model effective theory. That is, if you want for these lectures, the working definition of um, Standard model EFT is when we can take our hefts and write it in terms of a doublet, capital H. And oh, well, on this, of course, much more on uh, the lectures uh, by Professor Trott. So I'm not going to go into this MEFT much at all. But what I hope becomes clear out of this discussion is that this MEFT is a special case or a limit that we can take um, in hefts that tries and be more encompassing. And well, maybe this is being a bit pedantic, but um, the fact that it uh, contains this meft means that this difference between the two, or where when people sometimes refer to heft, they talk about heft modulus meft, or everything that is in heft that is not in smeft, but it's meft itself, it's a limit or that can be contained in heft. Um, so to make that explicit, uh, I'll, that's what I do in my papers and it's not a widespread notation, but I'm calling this heft modulus meft series, um, protein series in my, in my lectures, uh, in my papers just to be explicit, or sometimes I just call this modulo um, series heft over smeft. Good. Okay. Um, Let's move on to the third component in our EFT um, formulation. We've already have the particle content in our heft. <coughs> we have the gauge transformation properties and their symmetry. We can add into the mixed custodial or not, um, depending on how general we want to be. But now what is 
the expansion parameter or that uh, sorting out procedure to tell us which um, operators in our Lagrangian to consider first. Because a priori, with arbitrary um, insertions of, of the fields, we can build an arbitrary, an infinite number of operators and we need some rule to tell us uh, which ones to consider first so that we can make sense of our EFT. We'll take this to the Lagrangian in a minute, but for now it's easier to discuss it in terms of amplitudes that get rid of some of the redundancies um, inherent to Lagrangians. And that's uh, so the reason why um, there's a big focus on amplitudes these days and you're learning about them in this school as well. So let me go back to that amplitude of uh, longitudinal W portion scattering. And now, Define F such that the amplitude that we obtain is S over F squared, which implies defining F prime of F squared as one over V squared minus one over F squared. This is um, a definition that you can make out of the amplitudes. If you just look at the amplitude, all you see in here is a term proportional to the center mass energy S with a constant out front, so I might as well just call it F squared and take it as my input if I'm just looking at the amplitude. And the relation to the Lagrangian is not as simple, but that is what it is explicitly. So now to identify our um, EFT expansion, we try and write the next term in, 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 well, in our EFT expansion. Which I write like this in terms of lambda. Capital lambda we define to be the cutoff uh, of our theory, which is to say the energies at which our EFT stops converging, stops um, making sense, and the new complete theory takes over with new particles of mass approximately lambda. And I'm writing <clears throat> that correction in a factorized form as one plus center mass energy S over the out of scale lambda square with some coefficient in here that will give us that correction. If you are a minimalist in your head, you might be thinking, well, lambda is an energy scale. F, uh, the way you define it, is also an energy scale. The amplitude for four point is dimensionless. So F has dimensions of energy. So why don't we identify F with lambda and make our life a little simpler? If it's dimensional analysis, you might as well make them the same. Well, they're not um, the same in general, as we'll try to show explicitly with an example. Let's say that um, we know the ultraviolet theory that's producing this, and it looks uh, something like a particle of mass lambda and coupling G star. We can get that same amplitude for this ultraviolet theory to look something like d star square is lambda minus s. That's just a propagator for lambda square minus s. The propagator of that um, particle with the numerator being s. And if I expand this, For low values of s, I get g square is lambda square one plus r of lambda square. And out of this, making a correspondence with what we wrote before, up here we can see that what we call f is going to be lambda over g star. And lambda is lambda, <clears throat> but in particular, I see n alone is over one in this case. So that's telling us that the scale f can be if um, the physics is weakly coupled, the scale f might be much larger than lambda than the mass of any particles. 
And that's actually um, something that we've seen happen before. So Fermi's theory um, was pointing at a scale of 246 giga electron volts, the electron with BEF, if you translated that EFT into uh, scale F, but the W boson showed up way before that scale is not 246 giga electron volts, it's 80 giga electron volts because it is a weekly couple theory. But it could also be that we don't have a weekly couple theory. And in that case, we can fall back into perturbative unitarity to tell us that roughly speaking, lambda has to be smaller than that. If, you, if we use perturbative unitarity, as we did before, like eight pi times F, which is of course consistent with um, this limit that we were taking before. It could be that the masses of particles are well below uh, the naive um, perturbativity constraints. That's fine. And it can be the case. But it's good to make this distinction. And it also makes clear that the expansion is indeed in energy over uh, the cutoff square, which is also telling us that whenever we reach energies around the mass of the particle, the whole theory breakdown is, does not converge anymore. Those extra terms should be added up. And that could happen well before with the scale of perturbative unitarity. That's clear enough for amplitudes, I hope. When we try and translate it into a Lagrangian, it's not as uh, straightforward. In particular, we note here that the way we've defined this in the amplitude, the scaling of that first derivative um, with respect to the Higgs of that function has a scale dependence that is not any simple combination, it's not a, any single scale, it's this combination. So we might want to keep you know, um, description, the arbitrary functions of this little h, this um, Higgs inlet arbitrary and not made explicit. For the same reason, we won't expand our matrix U in terms of the goldstones for whatever parametrization we're having, because we want to build um, all of the invariants, all of our terms in the Lagrangian explicitly invariant under our gauge symmetry. And we now have a few transforms, even if it's this complicated function of the goldstones. So, what one might try and do is just look over our shoulder and see what uh, Professor Chod is doing um, for his MEFT. And then we have a simple count in there, uh, dimensional analysis that tells us what well, any term in the Lagrangian has to be dimension four, mass dimension four. But we can write any term in, term, in any operator in terms of our cutoff scale as an overall factor of those uh, four powers of mass, and then each of the fields divided by its um, mass dimension. If it's a fermion, three halves. If it's a derivative, lambda. And this also includes field strengths, where we have the commutator of two derivatives, we get a field strength. Then powers of u are for free, so to speak, because it's dimensionless. You can have as many of them as you'd like. Um, and that's what simply copy paste in this mapped into this will tell us. And that what works well for the standard EFT doesn't work as well in here. You can still use it, but the order one, or the, not the order one, the coefficients of these operators are not always order one as it happens. Because if I write this explicitly out, we'll have to just write a few of the terms in this series. It will seem like the potential term that will be simply no other fields in here, just a function of the Higgs, comes with four powers of the cutoff. So it looks like an aggravated hierarchy problem in this case. Um, that will tell us this is the most leading term, the most relevant term in our action. As we know, that's not the case and the Higgs mass, for example, that comes out of this potential is small. So we can say, well, just like the standard has that hierarchy problem, it is in here, and we just tune or have this parameter be small. Um, 
after all, by definition, we're just talking about the particles that are in the IR. So anything in here should have a low mass. And then it tells us that the next, well, the next term will be the derivative of those constants squared um, with the dimension full cutoff. But again, we know that's not quite on the right ballpark because instead of lambda, what we saw appears in here is d squared. Again, we can account for that just having a small coupling in here. And then one will think that one of the possibilities for the next order is a Yukawa term and then a fourth derivative of four constants, which will be in the same footing as, for example, gauge kinetic terms of, uh, or fermionic kinetic terms. And just to not try and be so general and uh, perhaps miss the point, if we just take it back to the amplitude that we had there before, we have that the operator that will contribute those S squared terms will be a four derivative operator acting on the constants. And with this normalization to reconcile this with the next other term that we wrote in here, we'll have to have that the coefficient is V electroweak depth to the fourth power of well, square x squared. So in this um, normalization of the operators, you get uh, to reconcile this with a sensible expansion that has a tiny, tiny coefficient. One can do better than this um, if one uses nice dimensional analysis, which is, um, again, I don't give the reference here, but it was laid out um, some 40 years ago. And it's a bit of a misnomer because it's not all that naive. Uh, deriving it is, uh, takes a bit of, um, of um, analysis of diagrams, of uh, simplifications, and it is something that is actually sketched in the notes. And you can try it yourselves. Um, so let me actually show you. Is somewhere here, and you can see how this normalization works and makes use of, a con, um, of the convergence of the loop expansion. And in particular, I encourage you to try this um, relation on any diagram that you can find. This tells us that the number of loops, number of loops L equals the number of internal particles minus the number of vertices minus one. So you can, you can try and draw as crazy a diagram as you'd like, and I guarantee this uh, would satisfy those relations. For all we are um, interested in though, what we, I find useful about this like naive dimensional analysis. It tells us that it's using that um, the convergence of the loop expansion to give us a basis in which coefficients smaller than one guarantee that loop computations make sense, that you can actually compute and the theory uh, can be made sense of because coefficients in this normalization, any larger than one, um, give you a loop conversion, a loop expansion that doesn't converge, um, as you can again see on that exercise. With this normalization, um, <clears throat> we have that instead of just lambda, the cutoff, uh, a scalar field will have an extra factor of four pi, uh, the relative will still have a factor of lambda, and the fermion will get an extra factor of four pi in there. And again, the information, the non-trivial information that NDA is giving us is that you cannot have any coefficient that you can possibly imagine in there, but there should be smaller than one for your theory to make sense. It is not as straightforward effort to adapt it to Higgs effective theory because of uh, that um, condition of not expanding our scalar fields out, but having them in that matrix U to preserve gauge invariant and this little edge also being an arbitrary function in there. But we can, um, do the same for fermions and derivatives, covariant derivatives, 
and a more um, in tune expansion with what we know to be um, the coefficients of the operators out there. So, for example, this Carl counting that reads as simple as the number of derivatives, that's the number of fermions is half of any operator, will tell us that all of the kinetic terms are of the same order, which is sensible. And if we go back to the operator that we are writing in there, now it comes with a normalization of one over four pi squared, which like dimensional analysis is telling us it should be smaller than one for things to converge. And when we compare it with what we had in the analysis for amplitudes, um, it has an extra factor of four pi square, which makes it a bit more order one or potentially order one than the other notation. Good. Um, but because things are not so simple, this is um, <laughs> as clear as this is. It doesn't show explicitly the decoupling limit of our theory. That is to say, we can have, let me see if I have room for it here. We can add an other operator to our um, theory that will be on the same footing as the kinetic term for the fermions. I and can look something like this. Poly matrix between two fermions contracted with the derivative of the Boltzmann. Something like that, a schematically, that is uh, size square. And it's on this counting on the same footing as. A kinetic term, and in particular, as I mentioned, let's coefficient up front. It is, <clears throat> it is, however, a type of operator that we know is not there in the standard model limit. So there's, so to speak, a hidden dependence on the cutoff of the coefficient of this operator that we cannot deduce from dimensional analysis because it's a function of two scales, actually lambda over V or something, that would in that decoupling limit go to zero. That's something that we cannot know really and we cannot put in by hand, but some of the attempts to address this type of questions go like this. Some of uh, other authors, uh, this is uh, detail, the references are in my, uh, Notes again, opt for defining the leading order. Now this is uh, not using a, a strict um, derivation for it, but just giving it to you right away. And say, this is what I call the leading order, not with any particular counting rule. Um, and they define it so that it's actually looking like the standard model with kinetic term for gauge bosons. And uh, the scalars, this, this kinetic term for page poses that could have an arbitrary function of the Higgs in there, but they uh, choose not to put it in there. We do know that in the standard model limit, um, it will be the case, but it's hard to justify in, in general grounds, setting it to one. Um, and then just Yukawa terms and the potential. Now, knowing this, having specified this, the Next, the corrections or the next to leading order, that's what we mean by NLO, can be pinned down by looking at the one loop divergences, ultraviolet divergences, and what these terms will look like. So once you've defined that, for example, you have that at the one loop level, this term that we've just discussed will be generated. And so in this convention, that is indeed a subleading term that will be less and less important with respect to the standard model in the decoupling limit. You can also have <clears throat> field strengths contracted with fermion bilinear. Uh, that fourth derivative 
of bosons is also sub-leading, but it was also sub-leading with the NDA counting or from the operators or um, that field strength square with a function of the Higgs and possibly custodial violation there as well. As it happens, we can do, and we have done better than just trying to guess what these guys are. Um, the ultraviolet divergences that this Lagrangian produces have been computed and are known. Again, the references are in the paper, and we know how um, the coefficient of these operators and those of the leading Lagrangian run at the one loop level, how they change with scale. All right. So I know this is a bit um, disorientating, in particular as compared with um, the standard model EFT, where you can just introduce a cutoff scale, put it according to a simple analysis of the mass dimensions of your operators, and you know what's leading, you know what's subleading, that's well defined there. Um, and you, we know, or we see explicitly how the standard model is recovered by taking that cutoff to infinity everywhere. So that's a theory in which the decoupling of um, very massive new physics is explicit and in your face in Higgs effective theory in part because it's trying to be so comprehensive and describe theories that need not necessarily decouple. Something that will come to the um, the expansion is not as easy to pin down. But it also means on the flip side that the possibility of those um, large deviations from the standard model in the form of that size square du operator or any other that is uh, leading and potentially comparable with the standard model contributions gives us further one or large deviation from the standard model that we can test experimentally and tell if they're there. And there will be a very distinctive uh, signal um, in contrast with the standard model EFT. And that's the one word of encouragement that I want to give you after this discussion of those uh, different countings that the ultimate uh, judge, after all, is experiment. Uh, we can, it's not an endless series talk that we're talking about here, but we have the LHC to compare data with and uh, um, tell us which coefficients are large, which ones are small. And as you might know, and you, you'll learn in other lectures, uh, the standard model seems to be well in agreement, but there's a lot of room for deviation still. Okay, so um, what is it? I have five more minutes, maybe, Mike? So this would actually be a good point to stop at the reaction hour. If you could, or if you need. Yeah, no, no, that's also perfect. perfect. Is it perfect point? No, it's, I was, yeah, this is a good place to stop, actually. Yeah. All right, let's uh, ask if there's any questions. But first, let's thank Rodrigo. <laughs> Question? Oh, you say that the tone introducing the it is in some other words, uh, is the uh, use the leading term and uh, using the ultraviolet divergence from the one loop. So it means that uh, um, introducing the new term as a counterpart, I, I miss something. Uh, what, what is the meaning of the new term from the one loop with the divergence? I introduce the new term from the one loop with the divergence. Right, so these okay, so these guys here. Um, yeah, so the the way these, I'm hoping, I think I got it. Uh, this is what you were talking about at these um, counter terms here. So the the procedure that uh, is followed here is to say, <clears throat> or to focus on the one one of the distinctive properties of the standard model, and that is that it's renormalizable. As opposed to the standard model, if I just write this theory right here that I just handed over to you as, um, as 
what I call the leading order theory. This one is not renormalizable. I mean, I'm using maybe uh, all notation because what I mean by non-renormalizable means that when you compute um, one loop graphs in this theory, whatever they are, um, something like this, maybe. This might contribute to, again, I'm talking about like doing all those some bosons in here. This might contribute to, for example, four derivatives on a field in there. And further, it might contribute with it with, uh, if we're using dimensional regularization or others, or just a simple cutoff um, with the logarithm of the cutoff square. So this is a term that diverges in the UV and requires the addition of a counter term of the form P for U to the four power that you didn't have in your original Lagrangian. So this is why this theory is not renormalizable because whatever you define as leading order that is very split and it's here would mean that at the one loop level, there's gonna be new operators that appear and have a coefficient that diverges uh, in the UV and require the addition of a counter term. So this is saying whether you like it or not, if you started with this action, you will need these operators. Oh, the counter term. The counter, yeah, so you add the counter term with the loop one loop contribution that cancels out that divergent piece and you're left with some finite coefficient of the operators see after the renormalization procedure. So this, yeah, they're there again. It happens, um, they do, what well, they do run with the uh, renormalization group. And in particular, if you say, even if you said, for example, the addition of these two, let me make room for it. Well, it so happens that the addition of these two equals zero at some particular scale. Even that statement is not stable under the randomization group equation because that coefficient in there is gonna be proportional to the logarithm of some energy scale or some reference energy scale E star. So even if you set it to zero at some energy E equals to E star, this operator will run and it will be non-zero at a different energy. So what I'm trying to say in here is that these operators are really required by the theory at the one loop level. They cannot be um, consistently set to zero at all scale. So if you want to include more different operators, you mean? Uh, yeah, if you want to include more, more another operator, you want to calculate the two loops on this and loop on more. Oh, right, right. So yeah, so this, exactly this procedure, the way they write it, um, or they describe it, and um, expanding to next to leading order will be, what are the operators that these operators produce at the one loop, mm -hmm. coupled with what are the operators that this leading order Lagrangian produces at two loops? That will give you the N NLO Lagrangian, mm -hmm. and this procedure can be iterated to however many uh, loops you want. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's, that is the organizing principle that they, they propose in, in this setup. Thank you very much. Thank you, thanks for the questions. That's the end of the long day, but are there any other final questions? Okay, I think we should close the session for today then. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll see you tomorrow for the next day.
We'll see you soon. Yeah, goodbye, everyone. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.